It transformed what was sort of always this handout, uh, help us, right. to this real position of we're winning the battle, we're, but it is still a battle and we want you to join us. Yep. And that's why I loved it. It was the, the boldness of what you could tell to the public, but it was also the intimacy with which the campaign could uh, be driven at the individual level. In an ever-changing world that's all about staying connected, building connections, and seeing where the next collaboration takes a marketing campaign. From an initial brief to the follow-through, what paths are going to make a campaign success more than a possibility? Hi, I'm Brett Marchand, CEO of Plus Company. This is Partners in Possibility. You may have heard about Sick Kids in Toronto. Today, we'll talk about the organization's huge fundraising targets and how one simple idea forever changed the face of charity. Sickness doesn't mean weakness. Joining me in this episode is Ted Garrard, who as Sick Kids CEO had the vision for the Versus campaign and took a big risk with the bold Versus concept. We'll hear how he worked with Cassette to make it the largest fundraiser in Canadian healthcare history, raising $1.7 billion in seven years. We'll take a look back at where it all began. The idea, origin story, the objectives, and the risk. Let's start, um, maybe just some context, yeah. because we're talking about sick kids, obviously, and not everyone that listens to this understands some of the nuances of running a hospital foundation, because there's a hospital board, and then there's a foundation that raises all the money, right? right. And so maybe just tell us a little bit about how that works in your role, and, and then we'll, we'll dive sure. into the campaign. So the hospital was founded in 1875, which makes it one of the oldest children's hospitals in the world. And um, it was around that time when Dickens was, in fact, raising money for Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, which is the oldest children's hospital in the world, uh, that people began to realize that you had to treat kids differently than you treat adults. And uh, essentially, the uh, hospital managed to eke its existence out of private philanthropy in the community and, um, you know, the odd government grant. Uh, and then it was really in the 1970s when uh, foundations were carved away from the hospitals right. in order to do two things. Number one, to make sure that any monies that were raised from donors were kept separate from government money, uh, i.e. no scoop and take some of that money away from them. Yep. Uh, but secondly, to really allow for a focus on philanthropy and, uh, you know, leave the, the heart surgery to the cardiac surgeons and leave the professional fundraising and volunteerism to the people who do it as a profession or as an av avocation. And, um, that's really the, the history of Sick Kids. It was founded in 1972 with two employees raising about a million bucks in the community. And, uh, you know, over the period of time, uh, we have grown to be one of the largest foundations in the world dedicated to children's health, certainly the largest in Canada. And, um, I've had the privilege of overseeing the evolution of the organization for the last 14 years. Yeah, you joined in 2009, right? I did. It was an interesting time to, to get a new job, by the way, yeah. on, the, on the heels of the financial crisis. Um, and when did the discussion start to happen about a new campaign and building the new hospital? Well, it was really, uh, and most people don't realize this, but it was a uh, a very planned uh, evolution of the Sick Kids campus, starting with a brand new research facility because our researchers were scattered in different buildings in yep. downtown Toronto. Uh, we uh, built uh, the uh, world's largest children's health research facility on Bay Street, uh, named uh, in honor of a great gift from Peter Gilgan. Yep. Uh, that was then the catalyst to um, move to the second phase, which was building a, a new 28-story 
uh, what we call patient support center, which was to house all of the executive and administrative and back end functions of the hospital. Um, and that would then further decant a number of people who were working in the oldest part of the hospital. And now we're at the stage of being in a position to uh, uh, tear down the oldest part of sick kids and, and to rebuild it from scratch to um, take what has always been an aspiration of not just being the best from a delivery of care model, but the best from a physical facility right. model. And so people told me at the outset, by the way, we have this grand vision, uh, now go execute against it. And I realized that uh, I loved the vision, but the execution was going to take a fundamental change to how the foundation had been doing its its business over the, you know, the past decade. And uh, uh, so, um, undaunted by the challenge, we got started. And when you entered into the new campaign, I think it was 2016, or at least, I mean, that's when Versus came out. Yeah. Uh, but obviously you, even though you hadn't announced at that point you were going to build a new hospital, you right. knew that was coming. What what was the target? What, what were you trying to raise? Well, originally we had set a target of a billion dollars, which would at the time have made it the largest ever healthcare fundraising campaign in Canadian history. Uh, but as campaigns, uh, you know, come and go, the goal then got raised to 1.3 billion and then 1.5 billion. And ultimately we closed the campaign on March 31st with uh, $1.7 billion raised, which still makes it the largest uh, campaign for healthcare ever done in this country. And actually one of the most substantial campaigns ever done in the world for uh, children's health specifically. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was... Uh, you must be very proud, by the way. It was proud. And I had my sort of, for me personally, part of the vision was um, Sick Kids is very much one of those um, revered public institutions in our city. As yeah. Jordan Bitov reminds me, he said, there's two iconic brands in Toronto. One is the Toronto Maple Leafs and the other is the hospital. Post-World War II, when uh, you know, the troops were coming back home and Toronto was home to maybe half a million people. 85,000 people out of a population of about half a million lined up to take a tour of sick kids on the day that it opened. Wow. And it said to me that there was something about the pride that the community felt towards sick kids mm -hmm. that I wanted to emulate in this campaign, both in terms of its success, but really rallying the community around this cause. You definitely did that, by the way. So we've heard about how it all began at Sick Kids and the high targets that Ted and Sick Kids set for this campaign. It was a pretty bold move for the hospital, but let's hear more about the challenges it faced to get buy-in for this campaign. I mean, you were there for seven years before we started the New Versus campaign. Yeah. Uh, and you've done some great advertising, by the way. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, Sick Kids was was well known for a place that did did great advertising. Um, but you had, a, I mean, obviously a new challenge having to raise that kind of money, a billion to start, you know, ended up at 1.7 billion. What, what else was challenging about the campaign? Why, like, why did you come see Cassette? What, you know, what was the, what, what was in your mind? Well, uh, there's something that our former uh, VP of brand uh, strategy and communications, Lori Davison, always said, which was that there was a sea of sameness to what everybody else was doing. So and true. We were probably no different than that. Yeah. Great campaigns, but were they any different than so many others? And um, if we really did want to emulate this sort of pride in community, we needed to find a way of engaging with new population groups and uh, people who had never thought about supporting sick kids uh, in the past, and to really be bold in the way in which we talked about sick kids, because the vision was bold. Right. Yeah. And you know the the way in which you tell your story has to sort of match up with the sort of the boldness of the vision. And that's when we said, you know what, 
pause, reset, let's do an RFP, let's have a bunch of different agencies come in and, and tell us how they might transform the way in which we were uh, uh, branding and talking about ourselves. And that led us to Cassette and, um, and the start of a, what's been a, a phenomenal partnership over the years. Yeah, seven years. I remember well, by the way, I was, you know, we're here in the, in the, in the offices in Toronto and I think it was both you and Laurie came in to see the original we work, did. which I saw, I, mean, I, I, I hate to admit it, but only a few hours before you guys yeah, did. Yeah. And I remember thinking, this is amazing. This is, this is transformative. I hope they have the guts to do it. Uh, yeah. And you had the guts to do it. So tell me, tell me how, how you felt when you first saw it, when you first saw the idea of Versus. Uh, what I loved about the Versus campaign was the resiliency of it in that it could be a rallying cry for the community, but that you could take it down to the lowest common denominator and make it a personal right. uh, story as well. So, you know, I had my own battle statement, which was, uh, you know, uh, Ted versus apathy, because it drives me crazy that people who you know, should probably be supporting charity, uh, aren't. Um, so that was my battle statement, but it became uh, Dr. Kaplan's battle against neuroblastoma. It became Jack's challenge against Hodgkin's lymphoma. So there was an ability to take it right down to the individual level. And the other thing that it did is that it, it transformed what was sort of always this handout, uh, help us right. to this real position of um, we're winning the battle, we're, but it is still a battle and we want you to join us yep. in this. And one of the ways you could join us is by declaring what your own verses is, is and really trying to sell the uh, the story of what we were trying to achieve at Sick Kids. And, um, and that's why I loved it. It was the, the boldness of what you could tell to the public, but it was also the intimacy with which the campaign could uh, be driven at the individual level. And back to the earlier thing that you said uh, and that Laurie said to you, which is, you know, it's a, it's a sea of sameness, yeah. and particularly true with children's <laughs> charities and even children's yeah. hospitals, which is it's all about children being victims and right. or they need our help. and. Yeah, you know, and this really did it in a completely different way, right? Yeah, a different way, and and you know, it was not just always telling the story of the happy child that was um, uh, survived their diagnosis, but mm -hmm. was also prepared to take on some of the very tough stories about a a child who, uh, you know, for instance, twenty percent of kids still don't. Um, uh, overcome a cancer diagnosis and it right. was you know saying well let's tell you about grace and grace was one of the 20 percent and you know we still have work to do yeah and uh, it wasn't um, being afraid of shying away from those tough stories as well and interestingly enough parents really got behind this idea parents of of kids who were at sick kids because they had gone through their own personal struggles and they wanted a way in which to um, celebrate and commemorate the life of their kids. Mm. You, um, Mark Siebert shot all the yeah. all the ads and the original ad, I mean, made a huge yeah. splash. I mean, everyone was talking about it. I mean, I've only made a couple of campaigns or been part of a couple of campaigns in my life that have had that kind of impact. Yeah. That, that and probably I am Canadian, like, yes. you know, I mean, just literally everyone was talking about it but it wasn't all positive right at, at the very beginning right like it had some controversy it did i mean when you wake up the next morning after having launched the campaign and you see the headline in in the globe and mail sick kids campaign misses the mark right you have this sinking feeling in your gut that oh god what have i done here uh but you have to have the courage of your convictions and uh, with cassette's help we uh, uh, did a social audit of the uh, reaction around the, the campaign. And for every negative comment, there were over 10,000 that were oh, positive. Yeah. And, you know, usually that is the way you'll have a, a critic who writes a negative review and doesn't mean you shut down the production. Yeah. Uh, just as we didn't shut down the campaign. And 
people were trying to judge the campaign on the basis of one the first time they saw it as opposed to thinking about the body of work that was to come yeah. and the stories that we still had to tell I had a mentor who always taught me you have to have the courage to rise above your principles. And in this case, uh, you know, you had the courage to to move on and um, reassure people like the board of directors and the hospital CEO that uh, the sky isn't falling. We didn't make a mistake here. Let us prove it to you. And well, in the end, I think we did. I've never been thanked and applauded so much in my whole career and 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 yet you're the well i'm sure you've got it all the accolades as well which 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 are so well deserved i mean and some other people actually glommed on to it i mean it had that early criticism but that seemed to completely disappear yeah. early on um so talk about some of the celebs who got behind it because i know well uh the one story that we uh, featured on Grace, who was one of the 20% of children who didn't uh, overcome her cancer diagnosis. Uh, it just so happens that the family was friends with Haley Wickenheiser, who, you know, uh, national celebrity, sports celebrity. Uh, captain of the women's ho- hockey yeah, team. Yeah, captain of the women's hockey team and a wonderfully decent person who was training to be a doctor, actually, yeah. herself. Um, and it just so happens that Haley was best friends with uh, Ryan Reynolds and Ryan saw the work and he all of a sudden said, tell me how I can help. You know, every time we would put a new ad out there, Ryan would be sending it to his network and it wasn't before long I was getting donations in from places like Iceland and Korea and, (laughs) you know, French Polynesia and you know, was it Was it because of sick kids? Maybe not the institution, but it was because the work was speaking so passionately to the people who were watching it. And um, and I think that they were uh, taken by the cause of children's health. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk about how sick kids measured success in this campaign and how it kept moving its objectives higher and higher. Welcome back to Partners in Possibility. I'm Brett Marchand. Sick Kids Versus was clearly a huge success, and Ted will share his key learnings. Listen, it was copied a lot, and a lot of other people have tried to do something similar, not to the same effect, obviously. It's won lots of awards internationally, as you know, won at Cannes. I mean, won everything. And I think in many ways, it's actually fundamentally changed people's point of view about how to do great cause advertising, which you should be very proud of. But I think the numbers are the most impressive, right? So you were telling me earlier about sort of pre-campaign, post-campaign, what the sort of run rate was. Well, we were raising about 80 million dollars a year when I arrived and now it's well over 200 million dollars a year. Um, We had a couple of hundred thousand of uh, donors who would give to us each year. Now it's 330,000 donors and this all uh, is because the profile of the sick kids was elevated through this process, but also the cause of children's health was elevated. And I think that was really important. And we've used the campaign to really reach new audiences that uh, we had not uh, reached before. Our core demographic has always been moms and women and uh, we needed to figure out ways to reach, you know, the millennials of the world, the grandparents who figure, I've done all my parenting, I don't need to think about supporting sick kids. Uh, the new communities that exist in a very diverse, multicultural uh, country who may never have thought about giving to a, a hospital before because it yeah. uh, it was just was never part of their uh, experience. Um, And that's why the tonality of the campaign was also important, because we knew that, you know, if we're going to hit the gamer community, uh, you got to be telling the story in a way that they're going to sort of get. There there was more strategy 
that people probably don't realize that went into the design of the campaign to reach audiences and to tell the story from a different perspective than just simply creating good ads, Yeah. right? By the way, this is another part of the strategy that we did is, and I credit Laurie Davison for all of this, was making a story out of the story. Right. Um, so trying to take the campaign, because we're a charity after all at the end of the day, and we don't have, uh, you know, McDonald's or Cheetos budgets to spend on uh, being able to buy ad time. So what we did was uh, involve uh, the different columnists and, and reporters in being able to talk about the transformation, why we were doing it, what we hope to achieve, etc. And then using their coverage of the uh, the new campaign as a way to amplify what we could buy. Yeah, all that earned and media. And all that earned media was huge. So And it builds on itself, there. right? Because once you get earned media, somebody talks about it, then they want to see it, then they talk to other people about exactly. it. Well, let's let's talk about what, I mean, you've made one of the great campaigns in Canadian history, yeah. if not in charity history, honestly. Um, what would you tell somebody who's in your shoes eight years ago or or 14 years ago, what advice would you give them to do the same kind of thing? Well, number one, it's not being afraid to be bold. Uh, I think you have to uh, get outside of the typical charity narrative, which is uh, then sort of the handout and help us into really um, telling a compelling uh, and somewhat edgy story. Secondly, you've got to be prepared to invest. Uh, And I do give our board full credit in that uh, they were prepared to invest in this campaign in a way that many charity boards are not prepared to make the investment. And uh, that- Many of whom because they don't think marketing works or- Correct, correct. And- Which I don't know how you don't look at your campaign and realize that- Well, it did work, uh, but you don't see the results right away. That's true. And so you have to, be prepared to think about it as a a longer term investment than one that's just going to all of a sudden start generating, you know, money coming into the the, the coffers because it doesn't work that way. Um, I think the third thing is the talent. Um, And that's everything from having the right ad agency and the the strategists and the creative people and uh, even the staff back in your own organization to be able to um, think boldly, but also execute flawlessly. And um, investing in those people was really important. Something that I really haven't talked as much about, but it's equally important is the authenticity of the campaign. Mm. Because you can't make this stuff up, or if you do, you're telling the wrong story. And when you had uh, parents applauding the the creative um, and people sort of openly weeping at every single you know creative piece that we would put out. It, it, for them, it was genuine and authentic. And um, one of the things we do at Sick Kids is we make sure that every you know piece of creative is tested against sort of the the parent reaction to it. Yeah, which the real asset does. Because, you know, the the authenticity will easily get exposed if you're not really telling the the true story. Yeah, the BS meter comes out quickly. Exactly. You know, another uh, piece was uh, don't create a campaign like this with a shelf life for a couple of years because you're not going to get the full benefit of what it can offer you. Um, And I think that is, you know, that's been a a key learning. We're coming up on, you know, several years of being able to have having used verses to tell the narrative around, let's build a new sick kids. Well, now the next phase of iteration is trying to use things like artificial intelligence and 
uh, data analysis to get better outcomes for kids. But Versus is still going to be the platform by which we tell the story. Yeah. And people move off platforms way too soon. They way do. too soon. And my, my point has been, no, let's continue to use the performance brand and the Versus, uh, if you will, iconography and uh, in being able to tell that story too. Um, and that's the brilliance of this campaign was that you you can go from one story to the next story to the next story. Well, listen, Ted, thank you for being bold, for being audacious, yeah. and for being a great partner. Yes, absolutely. It's been fantastic. Thank you for this talk. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to Partners in Possibility. That was my discussion with Ted Gerard, former CEO of SickKids and visionary of its hugely successful fundraising campaign. I hope you've enjoyed our look back at this amazing campaign, and I look forward to seeing how Cassette and SickKids continue to break fundraising barriers.